So uh, okay. it's got some good volume here. I don't know if anybody else can. I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm in the shower. Yeah, this is great. I'm just looking to see if he's okay. okay, he's got his thumb up. up uh, okay, so, so when it starts to blast out, out again, it's his fault because he's the AV guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just the security guy. I'm responsible for the bad, <clears throat> for the software. Um, and so how many of you, first off, how many of you know what a Linux security module is? Okay, how many of you know that there's one other than SC Linux? Even better. Okay, great. How many of you use the, how many of you actually use one in anger? There, there are two of them. Okay. Well, he's been angry at it. <laughs> That's SC Linux. <laughs> okay, I am officially the the, uh, the leader of the loyal opposition to SC Linux. So, just uh, so to put things in a little bit of context here. Um, so one of the things I've been working on recently, uh, in addition to, to a couple of other uh, lesser, lesser activities, um, is that the security module infrastructure was designed uh, very early on and had some serious problems, the, not the least of which was that um, by the time the original design had, had fallen out, you could only have one security module at a time. Uh, which meant that if you if you really liked SC Linux and you liked one you know kind of the one ring that was in control of everything, you were pretty happy. Uh, but if you wanted to have a more mix and match model, where you might want a little bit of security like this or a little bit of security like that, or if you want to do something that was small, uh, using a security module, you couldn't do it because if you put it once you put SC Linux in and Red Hat does that, um, a lot of the other just you know. Ubuntu uses App Armor. Um, if you're using Android, you've got you've got SE Linux now as well. Um, once you put a security module in, you were stuck, and that was it. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't use a security module for for anything else. So that's fine as well as it goes. But the security modules we've got were designed back in the 20th century. How many of you realize that we're in the 21st century at this point? Okay, there's one guy here. He, he's had enough coffee. Okay, great. So this is ongoing work, and right now um, what we've done is we, we went through and did a complete rewrite of the security module infrastructure. So instead of having one vector of, of security hooks, you now have a, bunch of, have a list for each of the hooks of the, the security hooks that they get used. So um, when it started out with security module, you know, the security module work, you figure you have to have a logo. So Tux with a, with a pile of onion rings on his stomach, because everybody loves onion rings. Um, and onions are one of the classic things we use in security to talk about layers of security. So yeah, onion rings are completely appropriate. Maybe this is. Maybe I'll have to change that. That's not going over so well as I thought it might. Uh, physical onion ring. Maybe. Physical. Yeah. Re, yeah I don't know, like, the mix. But. Yeah. But then you start having metaphor problems, and and we don't want to have metaphor problems. All right. Um, so. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what, what we've got, what we've got going on here, and what we're, what we're planning to do. So this is all forward-looking, may or may not happen. Um, but we're going give it, to give it a, the old college try here. So we're going to talk about the stacking infrastructure that went into 4.2. Um, well, we're going to talk about major minor modules and then what we're calling extreme stacking. A um, little bit about some, a request that Linus actually made uh, over lunch one day. Um, some basic handling of how we have to do with, if we're going to have multiple security modules. And then finally, um, how we're going to do complete generic module stacking for, for Uber all us. All right, so first off, the difference between stacking and extreme stacking. Okay, stacking is a mechanism whereby you can have multiple security modules with some set of restrictions. Extreme stacking is anything goes. If you want to have SE Linux and Smack and App Armor and Yama and uh, Whatever else come, comes along in the future, you can do that when we have extreme stacking. 
don't hold your breath. But, but, but we'll talk more about exactly how that's gonna, gonna come across here. All right, so stacking is a 4.2. Um, with 4.2, we introduced the concept of a minor module and a major module. Now, security modules are set up today so that you have the opportunity to use what we call security blobs. Um, all of the major kernel data structures that refer to system objects have security blobs associated with them. But you get one pointer. And that's kind of restrictive because that means that you only get to have one module that uses those pointers because otherwise they start clobbering each other and uh, it gets really ugly really fast. So we have minor modules that don't use security blobs and major modules that do. Unfortunately, the only minor module we have right now is Yama. Um, it does controls over certain, pat certain uh, restrictions on ptrace and restrictions on symlinks and I think it does a couple of things on mount points as well. Uh, Case Cook, who's uh, working at Google, on, primarily on Chrome OS, has got notions of a bunch of other stuff he wants to add in, in additional modules as well. So he wants to be able to come in and say, you know, if you've put camel case into your path, into your, your file name, I just don't like you. If you've got spaces in your path name, you must be a Windows guy, and I really don't like you. Okay. So he wants to put, be able to put in modules like that that don't actually have to have any persistent state, but that can make, make checks um, on particular aspects of the sphere and just you know, you know, make the determinations there. And then you can have as many of these as you like for your particular system. Uh, one of them is no hard links, for example. Um, and then major modules are the ones that use the the security blobs to keep track of persistent state. SE Linux, uh, Smack, AppArmor, they all have, have a bunch of persistent state about the processes and the objects that they're dealing with that they use to make the determinations to whether access should be granted or not. Uh, going forward, um, we're going to use minor modules. Again, you can still be able to use as many as you want. The major modules, um, you're still only get, going to get one, but we're going to start making some performance improvements. Uh, and we're going to start doing some things that are going to make the security modules a little bit easier to use. Because, quite frankly, I'm an advocate of people writing more security modules. Uh, I think that our security schemes are based out of 1985, or 84, if that makes, makes things a little bit creepier. Um, and they don't match the way we're using computers, computers today. Uh, so how many users do you have on your cell phone? One, okay. okay. Some people have two. Yeah, their, their work and their play. Yes, okay. Um, but Android went, went and said, hey, look, we only got one person using the phone. Well, we've got this convenient user ID. We'll use that to identify applications. And wait a second here. Now I've got two users on my phone, what do I do? Oh, we're going to have to have a user profile which is completely independent of the user ID. And it's like, dude. <laughs> okay, so extreme stacking. Extreme stacking is what happens when we finally make it so you can have any set of security modules you want. That's what comes after we do, do these performance optimizations, these, these simple things that we can do in advance. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to do, doing this. Um, we want to treat all the modules equally. Um, as many as want could use security blobs. Uh, you have as many modules as you want to make wh whatever kinds of decisions you want. By the way, if you can have separate security modules, you can break up SE Linux. So you can take the multi-level security part out. You can take the, um, some of the network controls out. You can make them separate modules so you don't have to have the MLS module if you're not using it. Or you don't have to have the type enforcement module if you just want to do the, the multi-level security. See, all kinds of good things you can do if you can do multiple, multiple modules here. And you can specify the order that they occur. One of the interesting things you have to realize is that if you're doing multiple security checks, at some point you have to decide, I've done enough checks to know that this isn't going to work, so I can stop. Uh, there are two basic models for this. One is always do all the calls. 
There's the all call model. And the other is the bail on fail model. Uh, since the existing checks for capabilities and um, for Yama, the way Yama was stacked initially, by, which was hard coded, was a bail on fail model. We've adopted that for going forward. This actually has some restrictions, or some limitations, uh, but it's the most performant model. And um, so it's got, it, it kind of won the, you know, won the battle. So, uh, which is why you want to be able to specify the order your modules run in. Okay, so Linus, I was sitting at <coughs> um, the, a, a private meeting in uh, Stevenson, Washington, at this, this lovely venue here, having lunch with Linus, and he said, you know, we've got a problem with the way security modules are handled in that you always have to go through three levels of indirection to make any decision. And this is, the cache lines are just on the floor every time you, you use the security module. So can't we put some of this information directly into the inode? So I said, well, ho-ho, of course we could. All we have to do, see, is put the blob into the inode rather than actually, well, they're just having a pointer. It's really very simple to do. The code is actually a lot cleaner this way and performs a whole lot better. Uh, I put the patch out about three months ago, and it was a cricket patch. Anybody not know what a cricket patch is? A cricket patch is a patch you put out onto the mailing list, and all you hear back is crickets. Um, that means you didn't even piss anybody off with it. <laughs> um, that's always embarrassing. Because you really, usually, if, if you can't get Alviro to come, in, come and flame you, you just haven't, you just haven't done your job. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we'll see how that actually goes. We're going to be pushing that, that forward a little bit more. Um, now, if we want to do, ex okay, so the, the first thing to, to note here is that uh, we've got a union here where we've got a union of all the security blobs. And you just compile in the ones you're going to compile in, just like you do today if you're going to build a kernel with, with the possibility of using multiple security modules. You have to compile everything in. Ubuntu does this. They can just compile in everything. Red Hat's a little bit more discriminate, you know, discriminating, discriminating about what they compile in. Um, but this means that your inode starts to get, get pretty big, so you limit it to just the one you want. Well, if you want to do extreme stacking, which is to say as much as I want any time I want, well, then you have to make it a structure, but that's actually fine because if you're, the, you know, the way I figure it, if you're compiling in a generic kernel, you're putting in so much code that you're not going to use anyway that, yeah, you're going to have device drivers for DECnet and you're going to have InfiniBand and how much Infin, how, who has InfiniBand on their phone? Okay, great. Just checking. You know, I, sometimes I get behind. I, yeah, I said something like that once and three people raised their hands like, Got to come up with a new technology there. All right, so this is all a uh, fun way to do So plan B. You always have to have a plan B, especially when you start putting out cricket patches. Um, now plan B is a very, is uh, again, you know, still, still a little bit hand-waving here. And this is one of those things where it's like on Friday morning, I thought, oh, I can start, I, I can do this on the plane. Well, about two hours into the flight, and, or about two movies into the flight, and it's like, uh, I don't think I'm going to get that code done. Oh, well, we'll, we'll just talk about it. We'll just wave our hands and, and talk about it. But we'll have the, the infrastructure do blob management and have the modules say, hey, here's how much space I need. And then it'll let, allocate the blobs and, and free them up. And so the, the security modules will, will still get by having one blob pointer. This doesn't have the performance impact uh, advantages that the putting the, uh, the blobs directly in the inode would have, but it's less, it's more likely to get people complaining about it, um, which is good because I'd rather have people complain about it than not say anything at all. So we're going to need to identify modules, um, and this is one of the things that, that's a little bit uh, interesting. When you only have one module, you don't have to say, well which security information is this, because it's already all there. You know, you, you know that by default. Uh, you're going to have to have a way to select which modules you want. Um, you know, right now, uh, if you say security equals module or security equals none, that's what you get. There's no way to say, I want Yama and uh, AppArmor, or I want AppArmor and SA Linux, 
because it doesn't make sense to say that. But in the future when it does, you're gonna have to have a way to say that. So we're gonna have to do that. Um, we're not gonna talk about the capabilities module because the capabilities module is just there, it, just there always anyway. Until at such time as, we've decided, as we decide that we don't need to have that, don't need to make the capability checks. Um, there's actually some motion in this direction for people who are working in the Internet of Things. How many of you work in the Internet of Things? Next year it'll be considerably larger than that um, because it's, it's huge. But um, the people who are working on the, the, the devices that you know, sell for seven cents, you know, they're that big, they sell for seven cents, and they're running a full Linux kernel. They don't want user IDs, they don't want capabilities, they don't want anything, but they want it to be Linux for some value of Linux. Um, I don't know why. It didn't happen on my shift. He's looking at me funny again. All right, and the order matters of the security modules because the first one that fails, things are gonna drop out. Um, so you might actually want to have the multi-level security module happen before um, the type enforcement module, or not. Okay. And then uh, if you're gonna report what, <laughs> okay. The other thing is that right now, if you wanna know what whether you're running a security module or which one you're running, you have to know the secret. It's like you have to know that you can grep for it in, in slash proc slash file systems. Or you go look in sysfs you know, sys, you know, kernel to see where, you know, where it is, you know, what modules you've got loaded. You have to do something tricky. We shouldn't have to do something tricky. We should just have a, a kernel interface where you say, Oh, by the way, um, this will tell you what LSM you have or what list of LSMs you have. All right, module selection. Again, we need to be able to set, spe specify it at boot time. Uh, Kconfig, you need to be able to say, when I configure this kernel, I want to be able to, to run, put these modules in and use them because that's the way I want, it, I want things to work. Um, and the default's going to have to be all. It's like if I compiled in a bunch of modules and I haven't said which one to use, use them all. Um, and they have to be done in, a, in a, some rational order. Um, the rational order is going to be the order in which they were submitted to the kernel, to the main line. So SC Linux will always get to go first. Uh, Smack will be next, AppArmor. Uh, even though AppArmor was, was proposed long before Smack was, it didn't get in until well after. So uh, that's me. Okay, so is this good enough? Probably. Maybe not, but uh, I don't know, know of a, a better way to go about doing it. Okay, so process attribute interfaces. One of the problems we've got right now is that since everybody was using, you know, everybody was assuming there's only going to be one module at a time, people started overusing um, proc add or current, which tells you the security context of your current process. Well, SE Linux will tell you one thing, Smack will tell you something else, AppArmor will tell you, tell you something different. If you have two of those running at the same time, what are you gonna do? Uh, so the reality is that the headed for in the future, um, we wanna have a, have a subdirectory for each of the security modules so you can go there and look. Um, and we wanna add another interface, which is gonna be the context, which is actually the full description. So if you wanna know all the security module attributes associated with the process, that's where they'll be. Um, and that's gonna be this big hairy string. So those of you who work in user space, get ready for this. Instead of just getting a context that says um, user T, you're gonna get SE Linux user T smack, um, what did I put down here? Uh, Bandersnatch, AppArmor's gonna be jub jub bird. AppArmor's the only one that allows spaces. Curse you, AppArmor. Because uh, that makes things a whole lot more complicated. Uh, but then in your library, you just do a scan F on the known string, and then it'll tell you what, what thing, and everybody would be happy. But that doesn't work in the space, right? Sure it does. Yes, scan F and spaces are cool-ish. <laughs> well, maybe it's wrong. That's their problem. Hey, they want to use spaces. Spaces are bad. Okay. So then extreme security contexts are gonna be huge. We're gonna put them in libraries. 
Um, but then you'll have to be able to get all kinds of security information about, about your system. Now, is anybody going to want to use this? Maybe not, but we'll, we'll see. So as we approach this, um, we're going to have to do some things. We're going to have to, have, again, we're going to have to have security blobs that contain all sorts of information. Um, and we're going to have to deal with sec IDs. How many of you know what a sec ID is? Excellent. I'm going to skip this then because you don't need to care. Um, but a sec ID is a kernel internal integer which represents a sec context, security context. NapArmor uses these. And the problem we've got is that the networking code, how many of you work in networking? <sighs> Okay, networking people don't like security people. Uh, this isn't new. Um, networking people have decided somewhere along the line that um, use a cryptographic token and then you know, just let us pass your cryptographic tokens around. That's security. Um, and if you want to do anything else, go away, kid. You bother me. So we've got a sec ID that gets passed around actually in some of the security stack. And when we said recently, you know, we'd really like to have a, a pointer in there rather than a 32-bit integer. Oh, my goodness, the shitstorm. Sorry. The, the, uh, the flame war. Uh, it was really bad. So we're stuck with these. So just leave it to say that there's a, an index into the, the security context here that we have to deal with. And that's fine. We're just going to have to deal with it uh, because the networking people won't let us have more than 32 bits. Um, and then we're going to have to add to the, the blob the fact the, the, the mapping between the sec ID and the context. But don't worry about that if you don't know what sec ID is. And then we're going to have to recalculate things uh, on a regular basis because when you, when you create a file and it's got an SC Linux value of this and a SMAC value of that, we then need to have a context which represents both. And so we're going to have to be adding more information. It's going to slow things down, uh, but only a little bit. Uh, okay, so what remains to be done here? Okay, what haven't we addressed? Well, we haven't addressed uh, that there's going to be a whole lot of user space changes. We're going to have to have, finally, a lib LSM, as opposed to a lib SMAC or a lib SE Linux or a lib app armor. We're going to have to have some user space code that deals with the, the security context, which, is, uh, which includes and in, incorporates all of those. Uh, we're going to have to have some dynamic, you know, we might want to have dyma dynamic module loading. Um, the guy who did Tomoyo is very, very keen on, on being able to load it and unload it. I'm not sure why, but, but that's just something he wants to do. He actually works at a company that has very large machines that run for very long periods of time. And every now and then they have a period where they want to see what's going on. So they want to load a module, do something, then unload it. Okay. Um, let's see what else. I want to do all sorts of uh, optimizations and some network communications that we won't go into in detail because I'm running over. And clearly, there's going to be something else we're going to want to do. Uh, not sure what. We're going to run into some sort of problem like blank, like spaces in security contexts in the library not handling them. Thank you very much. Um, or uh, I've got a context which comes in and goes out, or I've got a security module that sometimes puts an attribute on a file but doesn't, always. So then how do you deal with that? So we, have, we will have all sorts of challenges as people come up with different security modules, different security paradigms that we're going to be integrating in that don't fit the way we're used to doing them. We're going to run into more problems, but that's okay. That's just part of the fun. And with that, if I haven't confused you yet, I'll let you ask any other questions you have. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned security blobs. Uh, I don't know what those are. Can you explain that? Okay, so a security blob. Let's say I've got a file. All right? And I want to have some security information that's associated with that. What I'll do is I'll create an extended attribute, and I'll put the information onto the file. And then when the system is running, it's going to load in, it's going to create the inode for the file, and it's going to read the security information off of the extended attribute and put it into a data structure which I'm attaching to the inode. And since that is information that is specific to my security module, the system is, infrastructure calls that a blob because it doesn't care. You know, the, the, 
yeah, unless you're actually in your security module, whether that's an integer or whether it's a set of strings or whether it's a complex set of calculations regarding the phase of the moon and what have you, the system doesn't care. Only the security module cares about that, so it, it's an opaque blob to the rest of the system. And that's why we call it a blob. Okay, so the question is, if I have multiple modules, how do I ensure that the policies don't conflict? The answer is, you don't. All right, okay, now, how can, now, re remember that when you're adding a security module, you're saying that I'm gonna come, the policy is, as soon as any of them fail, you're done. Okay, so there's no way I can, I can create a security module that will say, this, well, I can create a security module that says A or B, but if I have two modules, one that's checking for A and one's checking for B, if A passes and B fails, it's out. If A fails, then you don't even check B because you're done. Uh, so when you're writing your module, you have to understand that. Now, this is already the way it's done with the basic security checks and the capability checks. So you do the basic, basic security checks Sorry, if that file's mode 700 and you're not the owner, you're out. We're not gonna do the capability check. We're not gonna do a check on, on the security module. The SE Linux checks aren't gonna get done. You're already gone. So um, when you're saying conflicting, the thing you can't do is you can't say, oh, yeah, I failed the, the, uh, the mode bit check, but that's okay because yeah, it's, it's before noon and in the morning people are allowed to make mistakes. Okay, you can't do that. You already can't do that. So if you wanna have, have something that's more restrictive, that's great, but you can't make it less restrictive than it already is. If you wanted to do that, that would be authoritative hit hooks instead of permissive hooks. We currently have, permiss have permissive hooks. Okay, and authoritative hooks were actually uh, proposed initially. Um, but that was, it was decided that Linux should always do the basic checks. Now, sometime last year, somebody came in and said, hey, uh, for embedded devices, I don't wanna do the basic checks. And it's like, well, excuse me, but you told us eight years ago we couldn't have that. Oh, but we want it now. Oh, okay, so it's in. So it's like, okay, great, can we go, go to have authoritative hooks? Oh, no, 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 they're too dangerous. Well, but you can do it. Oh, but that's an expert mode. So, okay, so next question. I've got a, okay, thank you. Okay, so it, at boot time, if I want, is the question if, if I want to disable a security module at boot time? Well, I would, if I want to disable the security module at boot time, I say security equals none. Because none will not match the name of the security module. So. <laughs> All right, so. So when you boot the system, there's a boot parameter which is called security. And it says secure, and you then you specify the name of the module you want to use. If you give it the name of, of a module that doesn't exist, none, for example, um, yeah, it would be, it, <laughs> oh, it's tempting, isn't it? It's uh, very tempting to create a security module called none. Um, and what would none do? Well, it, none would, would probably do my, the, the one that I've heard proposed, which is my personal favorite. Okay. No, it's the inverse fuzzer. It randomly fails. It <laughs> makes things randomly fail. <laughs> that's not random, that's malicious. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's, okay, yeah, the question is how, how would you tell the difference between um, SE Linux being ra failing randomly and failing maliciously? I know, never attributes malice, that which could be adequately explained. 
by SE Linux. <laughs> um, now, SE Linux policy is, is notoriously difficult to uh, comprehend. Uh, and the people who wrote SE Linux know this, which is why they had a 10-year-long project called CIL to come up with a different way to represent the, the specification language. Um, and it took them 10 years because the, the new version of the language is at least as, if not more so, incomprehensible than the, the original. Um, uh, that's a level of, when, when you get to a level of sophistication that's that hard to deal with, you're probably not doing yourself any security favors. But that's my opinion. You know, my opinion and, and $4 will get you the coffee down at the, at the break room. So, Next question. Hand, there we go. Okay, let's say we've got A, B, and C. A, C, and B, whatever. Yeah, Okay, so the question is, is there a, a clear change in the, way thing, in the way things are done? Okay, there, let's see, no. And the reason is that it works the same way now that it used to. It's just, it does it differently. Okay, it used to be that um, the capability code was actually hard-coded into the various security modules um, the Yama code was actually hard-coded in as well. So the way it was, was coded, you would go do the capability check. Well, actually, you would do the Yama check, then you'd do a capability check, and then you'd do actually the logic of your security module. So we pulled the capability code out of the various modules and put that directly into the stack. We pulled the Yama code and said, okay, here's the, pl here's the place you put minor modules. And then here's the list of the, the major models. Actually, we put, took, just put them all into a list. We said, we'll put the capabilities on the list first, then we'll put Yama on the, on the list next if you've got it compiled in. Then we'll put yours in when you register it. Um, so, and in the future, what, that mean, what we'll do is we'll just put them all on the list in the order you specify, and then they'll just get called. And then there'll be the big debate as to whether you want your module to be called first because it, it's the coolest one, or whether you want it called last, because you want to give everybody else a fair shake, and you want the last, you want, yeah, you you want the return code to be yours and definitive and always yours. So, no, no, because because the policies are all initialized prior to there being anybody any access for anybody. Now, if in the module we allow dynamic, that's, diff that's, a, that's a different thing. But that's weeks away. <laughs> okay, next question. It's the last one. But it better be a long one. Okay, going, okay yes, sir. What is it that you don't like about SE Linux? What is it that I don't like about SE Linux? Um, the problem with SE Linux, in, again, this is my opinion, and again, my opinion and $4 will get you the coffee. Um, when I sat down to understand SE Linux policy, in particular, I, I had a given file with a given context and a given process with a given context. De determining whether or not that process with that context would have access to that object with that context requires that you understand the entire loaded policy at that time. Because there are transitions which may or may not occur depending on any number of things when you go to make that access. So if you don't actually go through the processing of the, you know, in that the kernel goes through in order to implement that policy, you can't tell just looking at the attributes whether or not you will have access. Um, SE Linux works very well if what you want to do is take a program that does a particular set of things 
And you don't want to know, you don't really care what it does, you just want to make it so that you can create a policy that allows it to do that. And that, that doesn't, you know, you can say, okay, this policy allows this program to do what it does, and hypothetically nothing else. Okay. But that doesn't say anything at all about the security of the system. It simply says that this program doesn't, you know, it behaves de roughly deterministically, and all programs are supposed to do that. Now, yeah, sometimes they get hacked and start to do, you know, get code downloaded and start doing other stuff. That's bad. Um, but that's not what a security policy is all about. A security policy is all about, here are the things I want to protect. Here's how I want them protected. Um, so SE Linux discourages you from deciding how you want to protect things on your system and encourages you to say, I'm going to run audit to allow, gather up a bunch of stuff. That's going to write, write a policy for me. I'm going to pick that up, put it over here, and say, there, there's my policy. Well, why is that your policy? Well, because it's what ought to, ought to allow told me my policy ought to be. Well, why do you like that policy? Well, because it makes my system run. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of like saying, you know, the, the, the best way I can think of to um, protect my store is to see who comes in th through the door at midnight and give them a key. That's what I don't like about SE Linux. So. Okay, well thank you very much.